The topic for today is the secret of light and the solution to the theory of everything. In this presentation, I will discuss, in common terms, the knowledge of the underpinning of reality as you know it. To quote the great Nikola Tesla, if you only knew the magnificence of the three, six, and nine, then you would have a key to the universe. Well, today, I'm going to give you this cosmic key. Please observe that as I go through this presentation, I will often switch between two primary points of view, those being the scientific point of view and the religious point of view. We will begin this journey with the fourth hermetic principle, which is the principle of polarity. It embodies the truth that all manifested things have two sides, two aspects, two poles, or a pair of opposites with many fold degrees between the two extremes. To illustrate this principle, we can draw a one-dimensional line that extends forever in both directions. So, if we apply the concept of hot and cold to the line, you should clearly recognize that heat and cold are identical in nature, the only true difference being merely a matter of degree. Thus, it is the same for day and night, for good and evil, plus and minus, right and left, ad infinitum. However, you should also recognize that between these two extremes, there must be a central point of balance. And so it is in between day and night that you have a horizon. Between good and evil is indifference. Between plusing and minusing is equality. Between right and left is the center. Thus, in actuality, there are three polarities within the one-dimensional concept of the line. Now, in order to expand on this concept, we're going to invert this tripolarized one-dimensional line into three individual polarized lines. In other words, we are looking at the exact same information, only from a different point of view in order to expand upon it. We went from a 3 and 1 ratio into a 1 and 3 ratio. Looking at polarity from this point of view, I asked the audience, when does the parameters of polarity change? So if I apply the concept of heaven and hell on the graph, we can easily understand that heaven equates to the positive electrical force. Hence why we think of heaven as being up there while hell is equitable to the negative magnetic portion of the sine wave. Hence why we think of hell as being down there. And this would mean, by default, that Earth is in the middle, and thus in the plane of inertia or neutrality, or where the ground is grounded. Now, we're going to shift this concept to the right of the graph in order to continue our exploration downward into the fractal. Our first logical step is at ourselves, with our head, being the heaved up place corresponding with heaven, and her heel corresponding with hell. In fact, both are correlations of one another, just as earth in the middle is an anagram of your heart and rests between your head and heels. As we continue down the fractal, you will notice that the atomic structure of our very bodies and the very universe obey this property of tripolarized electromagnetic current, with the proton being positively charged or electric, and the electron being negatively discharged or magnetic, and the neutron having no charge or being neutral. I would like to take a pause right here and discuss our first noticeable academic inaccuracy, which is seen within the superscriptions of these atomic elements. Please notice that while the proton is correctly identified with a superscript plus sign, and the electron is correctly identified with a superscript minus sign, it is the neutron that bears a superscript zero instead of the expected equal sign. Well, why would this be? The answer is that whatever individual or group of scientists that decided on these standard notations did not catch that they had subconsciously changed points of view, those being the electromagnetic point of view and the numerical point of view when they were designating the symbology. This is not some grand conspiracy. Rather, it is simply the way the mind of man works. In fact, our minds are constantly changing points of view both within its own internal mental imagery and when expressing various points of view through our speech and conversations. If you wish to demonstrate this to yourself as a practical exercise, the next time you're in a conversation, record it. Then go back and count how many times the other person changed points of view within the conversation. Then count how many times you yourself changed points of view. You will find that both participants' viewpoints are subconsciously changed many times during the course of the conversation in order to convey the expressed information in the most efficient manner for their participants to understand one another. In general, the less descriptive we are, the less we understand. 
While the more descriptive we are, the more we understand. Although this does not account for physiological barriers such as accents, second languages, inflections, or even physical expressions and mannerisms during the conversation. Here, I ask the audience to please know that it is imperative to understand that polarity, points of view, and orders of magnitude are the three keys to both the philosophical and scientific concept of commensurability. Now, back to the subject. So delving into the quantum orders of energy, those being the quarks, with the up quark, the down quark, and the color force, then even smaller into the pions, with the up pion, the down pion, and the neutral pion, and still further down into the neutrinos, with the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino, we can see that these components also obey the law of polarity, but that the symbology could be much better identified and aligned with the concept of commensurability. So why all the different symbologies? The simple answer is because the discoverer of each new particle gets the prestige of naming the particle and symbols for the particles, which, by default, and to no fault of the discoverer, subconsciously removes our understanding away from what it truly is, which is polarized light in various orders of magnitude. Whether you prefer to look at it as a particle or a wave, although you should understand that a wave is not what a thing is, but what a thing does. In this early video, a brilliant particle physicist named Dr. Nassim Haramein discusses the fundamental forces, and at the 3-hour, 4-minute, and 25-second mark, he says, quote, When quantum physicists found that the protons were all stuck together in the middle of the atom, they calculated how positively charged particles could be that close together. They would have to have some huge force holding them together because they had a tendency to move away from each other because they're all positively charged. They calculated how much force it would take to hold them together, and they called that force the strong force, and basically invented a whole new force, which they didn't say where the force was coming from. Remember, quantum physicists say, we don't care about causation. We can invent anything we want. So they just invented a new force. They didn't say where it came from. Actually, when they found the quarks, they found that the quarks had to be squished together as well. So they made the strong force the color force at the quarks level, just inventing forces. What I'm saying is that if you consider quarks and protons as small mini black holes, then you calculate how the black hole would have a gravitational field. If you calculate the gravitational field for these mini black holes, then the gravity that these mini black holes generate is strong enough to hold the particles together, and you don't need a strong force or color force that were just pure inventions of modern physics." End quote. So, what Dr. Nassim Haramein just described is that because of their own misunderstanding, scientists keep inventing new forces such as the strong force and color force. I will add that with each uh, invention of the new force comes the inventions of new names for these forces as well as new symbologies for these forces, which only compounds the misunderstanding of the force itself, which leads, unfortunately, to uh, the mind of man astray and into the inevitable irreconciliation of incommensurability. So, back to our question. Does the parameter of polarity change by size? Now on this slide, we will move the concept of heaven, hell, and earth to the left and work our way up the polarized fractal. Uh, our first stop is the luminous level, where we see that the sun is clearly positively polarized, while the moon is negatively polarized. The sun travels east to west, while the moon travels west to east. The sun's light radiates, while the moon's light illuminates. The sun's light rarefies, while the moon's light putrefies. These are just some of the many polarizations of these luminous orbs we call the sun and the moon. Their neutral counterpart is the background of stars, which since ancient times were known as fixed stars which corresponds with the neutral polarity as they are pinned to the celestial dome and after thousands of years of observations show no serious signs of motion parallax. Moving to the next level of polarized information, we get to the terrestrial planets known to us as Mars, which is positively charged, and its feminine counterpart, Venus, being negatively charged, and finally Mercury, which is neutral or considered hermaphroditic. Now on to the jovial scale. We see that Jupiter is positively charged, hence the jovial planet, while his counterpart Saturn is negatively charged, and their father Uranus is neutral, hence why Uranus is neutered. We can call all these levels 
or orders of magnitude, whatever you wish, just as the luminous point of view, the luminous point of view to the second degree, the terrestrial point of view, and the jovial point of view. But the fact remains that the polarity has not changed. You can even switch points of view. For example, the principle of polarity still applies when comparing a planetary point of view, for example, Mars, Venus, and Mercury, with the gender point of view of a man, a woman, and a hermaphrodite, with a reproductive point of view of sperm, an egg, and the zygote, and from the point of view of light itself, light being positively charged, dark being negatively charged or magnetic, and the rainbow being neutralized or visible light in between. So when does the polarity change? The answer is never. So now that we have a clear understanding of the principle of polarity, we can conclude that the principle as originally written is only a partial truth composed of a dualistic thought pattern, while the full truth or whole truth is that of tripolarity. Thus, the ancient hermetic principle is fully understood when read that, quote, everything is triple, everything has three poles, everything has its pair of opposites and a center. Like and unlike and between are the same. Opposites and the middle are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet in the middle. All truths are but half-truths in a dualistic mind. However, a whole truth is a holy truth in a triplistic mind. All paradoxes, which are seeming dualistic contradictions, may be reconciled with the whole truth. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to take a look at the principle of polarity from the religious point of view. In other words, we're going to change our main viewpoint from the scientific point of view to the religious point of view. This slide conveys the planetary point of view for reference on the left, while a few of the trinities from both the Old and New Testaments show the clear underpinnings of tripolarized electromagnetic current, commonly known within the religious framework as the trinity, the triad, or the triune god. Here is a Hindu, Judeo, Christian point of view. Notice how well the electrical line begins to reveal itself. The more you add, the better it can be seen, as in this point of view, containing a Hindu, Judeo, Zoroastro, Christian point of view. On the positive polarized line, notice that Jesus holds the lamb, being a female ram. Notice that Abraham sacrificed a ram in the thicket. Notice that Ram is in the name of Brahma and Baram, both perfect anagrams of one another. And finally, notice that Mars, whose name is a mirror of the word Ram, rules Aries, where begins the right ascension of Meridian, or Ram, whose zodiacal symbol is the celestial Ram. Now follow the flow of information with the neutral and the negative polarized lines, and it will disclose the same pattern of commensurability. Ladies and gentlemen, what this means is that the secret of three is the forgotten knowledge of the understanding that light, which is the one thing, fundamentally expresses itself as tripolarized electromagnetic current, which is three things, or more easily said, that Tesla's secret of three is the secret of polarity, which further reveals the secret of commensurability. Congratulations, you now have a key to the universe that no one can take away from you. Or, as the Buddha said it, there is not but three things you can hide very long, the sun, the moon, and the truth. Understanding this, I will now switch back to the scientific point of view and show you that science itself proves this fundamental truth. Here we have a video, thank you, Santos Bonacci, of a scientist named Eugenie, who worked with Marconi, the inventor of the radio, who proved with a simple antenna and later an apparatus which you see in this video, that there are only two forces, with the earth being neutralized or grounded between these two countering forces. At the eight minute mark, he says, quote, this scientist made a machine that can detect one-tenth of a millimeter of movement of the earth. He says that according to this machine, the earth is still, hence terra firma. As it is firm, it is fixed, it is stationary, it does not move. And Jeannie goes on to say, the solar energy comes from the sun in a spiral and is right-handed. 
it enters the Earth and re-exits the Earth in a counterclockwise spiral. Okay, so what are the scientific implications of all of this? In other words, what are the implications from the scientific point of view? Well, to start, it means that the four fundamental forces are incorrect in that they are mislabeled and misidentified due to them being misunderstood. In other words, they are incommensurable. So what do I mean by this? Well, science currently understands the four fundamental forces to be the electromagnetic force, the gravitational force, commonly called gravity, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. So let us first take a look at the theory of gravity, which is simply defined as the phenomenon of attraction between objects and mass. Now let's take a look at magnetism, which is defined as the phenomenon of attraction produced by moving electric charge. So, in other words, gravity is the point of view of magnetism in relation to mass, while magnetism is the point of view of itself in relation to energy, being electromagnetism. This means that gravity and magnetism are the very same thing, only expressed from two different viewpoints, gravity being expressed from the point of view of incoherent or the diffuse steady state of electromagnetism as scientifically evidenced by mutual mass acceleration and magnetism being expressed from the point of view of coherent electromagnetism or focused magnetism as scientifically evidenced by point source acceleration which means that these forces can be combined and redefined or perhaps better defined as magnetism the universal indrawing force, measured in quantifiable and continuous orders of magnitude, which corresponds to everything that we have discussed so far. Following this logic, you can clearly see that the weak and strong forces would quickly follow suit and thus leave only electromagnetism and its varying orders of magnitude. And this is a visual, so you may imagine it along the one-dimensional linear tripolarized scale Whereas gravity is magnitude zero, or the incoherent, diffuse, steady state of magnetism, of which its measurable attribute is that of mutual mass acceleration. Whereas the weak force is magnitude of order one, and the strong force is magnitude of order two, forever into the quanta of the fractal. The next scientific implication is that the further forces are also incorrect, being mislabeled, misidentified and misunderstood. For example, in the 1970s, three physicists discovered that at extremely high energies, the weak nuclear force acted just like electromagnetism. So, did the scientific community combine the forces as you would logically expect? The answer is no. In fact, it did the exact opposite and simply created a new force called the electroweak force and classified this new force as an aspect of electromagnetism. Thus, science created itself uh, another new force, and the discoverers of that force received a Nobel Prize in physics. Again, this is not some conspiracy theory. The simple truth is that the scientific community, which is composed of the individual scientists themselves, being humans, and as brilliant as they are, simply do not understand what they are looking at and measuring. In other words, they can see the trees in which they study every aspect but have failed to see the forest which is composed of the trees, or to put it in another way, they are lost in facts rather than truths which gives meaning. Now, in 2015, CERN published an article which shows that the most brilliant minds in science are moving towards the logical conclusion which has been solved for you in this presentation. In this published article, it states that, quote, at small energies, the electromagnetic force is much stronger than the weak force, but physicists assume that these two forces could be two sides of one coin, perhaps eventually paving the way for the unification of all the four forces in the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can truly understand the information that I have presented thus far, this means that, from a scientific point of view, both the grand unification theory and the theory of everything has been solved. In other words, I've given you the answer to the test question. So, someone may ask, do you think you're smarter than all these brilliant respected men? The answer is no. It's just that I have a 10,000 foot view of the forest. In other words, while the scientists stand around the lawnmower tinkering in befuddlement, I'm Carl, the lawnmower man.
telling them the simple truth that, quote, it ain't got no gas in it. <laughs> so for reference, in this new model of electromagnetism, all your standard magnets will fall in between the magnitude of zero, formerly known as gravity, and one, formerly known as the weak force, where perhaps a standard bar magnet would be order of magnitude 0 0.1, down through a logical scale of measurement to perhaps a neodymium magnet, which is the strongest commercial magnet one can purchase, being an order of magnitude of 0 0.5. This is just an example, but you can see that a standardized order of measure will need to be agreed upon by the international scientific community. Okay, the next implication is that the spirit scientists are closer to the truth than the full-fledged scientific community. I would like to point out that in 2015, ironically the same year that CERN published the article I previously showed you, Dr. Nassim Haramain published his peer-reviewed paper titled Quantum Gravity and the Holographic Mass, in which he proved that the strong force is nothing more than gravity. He is only a short thought away from discovering that gravity is magnetism. Another prominent school of thought among the spirit science community is the belief that light is composed of dielectricity and magnetism. This is not entirely wrong. It is just partially correct. So with respect, I would like to offer a slight variation in order to clarify this particular model. So from this point of view, everything is believed to be composed of two things, dielectricity and magnetism. Well, instantly we can see that when one is discussing dielectricity, what is subconsciously inferred is dielectric polarization. It is called dye because it is composed of electricity and magnetism, hence the dye or two in dielectricity. This also corresponds to a dipole magnet being composed of a positive side and a negative side being mag magnetic. Thus, just as one has to balance an equation, the outlying magnetism is a duplicate property of the die component of dielectricity. So this component cancels itself out. Now, when looking at this model from a tripolarized perspective, it becomes crystal clear and actually corresponds perfectly with the universal sinusoidal wave. And down below the diagram of the wave, and just as before, I have inverted the 1 and 3 into the 3 and 1 model to expand on the embedded information inherent within the waveform. Here, from this point of view, we can see the circuit or circuitry of the wave. And the ancient ones knew this to be true. For the Testament of Solomon says, if one looks fixedly, the pillar is a little oblique, being supported by the infinite spirits as it is so today. And another major scientific implication is that the standard model of particle physics is incorrect. The first thing you should notice and the big hint are these groups of threes. Let's take a look at our tripolarized one-dimensional linear chart once again. What we see is an almost near-perfect match. And with a simple commensurate renaming of these particles, it becomes crystal clear. You will also notice that even the polarized lines correspond to the mysterious three-jet event phenomena that is baffling the scientific community to this day. Now I'm going to switch back to the religious point of view and discuss some implications within the religious community. First of all, this means that all religions are fundamentally the same. In other words, we all worship the same almighty God, which is light, the creator without form, only in different personified versions, being the creator in form. In the next few slides, I will take you on a journey around the world and prove this undeniable truth to you. Our first and foremost point of view is of God as the eye, being positive, negative, and neutral electromagnetic current. In other words, light which is the one thing that fundamentally expresses itself as three things. And here is the Masonic Eye of Providence and its many variations which express the tripolarization and inherent superconsciousness of light. And here you see the many variations of the sacred Egyptian Ben Ben Stone, each with its alternate versions of the story of the process of ascension. And here you see the mysterious Ecuadorian Eye of Providence that was discovered by Dr. Klaus Donna 
in which inscribed on the bottom in pre-Sanskrit says, quote, The Son of the Creator comes. These ancient humans were telling you that light returns to the mind of man. And here you see the ancient Babylonian math problem of trisecting the angle which they taught to their children. And here you see the three-in-one ratio of light clearly indicated in the endless Celtic Trinity knot. And also the same motif is found within the thrice interlocked triangles of the ancient Germanic Valknut, which was also associated with Odin. This is because Odin is the single eye. And here's the symbolic representation of the Punic civilization's chief goddess, Tanit, of Phoenician Carthage. Notice the sun balanced on top of the pyramid. Notice that it's a derivation of the Ankh. And you also find that the crop circles are telling you about the secret of light, as evidenced by this collage. And the secret of light was known in ancient Asia as well. Here one can find it in the Tibetan fire triangle. And here we can see the secret of light in the ancient Nazca lines. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not runways for ancient aliens, but they are representations of light beams. And the secret of light offers an explanation for the many mysterious triangle stones found around the world by scholars to include Australia and in North America, as noted clearly uh, that these are not arrowheads. In even the most desolate lands of modern Saudi Arabia, we find the clear evidence that ancient man understood the secret of light. Here we see a three-dimensional pyramid with an energetic tether to the sun. And perhaps one of the most famous, if not the most famous version, is that of the god Yahweh within Judaism, known to the Greeks as the Tetragrammaton. Ladies and gentlemen, we just went around the world together where it was conclusively shown that ancient man knew that God was light and represented by the eye. But even as the eye or triangle is the most popular motif, there are still many other variants or points of view that are commensurate with the eye. We can see that God is the wave, which is nothing more than a different point of view of the triangle. In fact, we can see many religious stories from this motif. Can you understand that Adam is the positive half of the wave? and that from his rib was created Eve, which is the negative half of the wave? Or that God created the world in six days, being the six positive signs of the zodiac, and rested on the seventh sunset, where the wave descends and transmogrifies into the sacred feminine. Notice that Sabbath means rest, and it is Saturn that both rules Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, and is exalted in Libra, the celestial Sabbath. Or that the wave as a whole is the tree of life, but understanding its perceived duality is synonymous with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, being positive and negative. Or that the inversion of the light wave is the snake in the garden. And here one can see that the Central and South American cultures identified with God in its version as the wave. And the Personification of God as the wave is readily abundant in the Australian Aboriginal motifs of the rainbow serpent. Just as God is the triangle, which is also the wave, is that God is the circle, which is defined by pi. For just as we prove that God is the triangle, which is also the wave, so it is the same that the wave is also a circle which in Aristotelian logic means that the circle is also a triangle. And isn't it fascinating that we can do our own check on learning in the fact that a triangle holds the least amount of volume while the circle holds the most amount of volume. The conclusion must be that these points of view are merely inversions of one another. 
And here, it should finally be understood by the audience why we find perfect stone spheres amidst the archaeological evidence of so many ancient cultures. Here is the evidence in Costa Rica and in Bosnia, located exactly where one should expect to find them. At the Bosnian pyramids and the stone balls found in Scotland that match the Platonic solids. These are over 5,000 years old and predate Plato by some 1,600 years. And probably the best evidence is uh, the Klerksdorp spheres, which were discovered by miners in 3 billion year old pyrophyllite deposits. Do you now understand why these spheres have three rings around the equator? Ladies and gentlemen, humanity is older than you can ever imagine. Or that just as God is the triangle, which is also the wave, which is also the circle or sphere from a three-dimensional point of view, so it is also that God is the circle and the square, because they are also inversions of one another. The check on learning being that both the circle and the square contain exactly 360 degrees. And to superimpose some religious concepts for your understanding, here we can see the entire creation story of Genesis as told from the geometric point of view, whereas Adam is the number one and the positive half of the sine wave and Eve is the number two or the negative half of the sine wave. It is Michael that stands as the guardian in the, in the middle of the garden of God. To conclude this portion of the presentation, it should be abundantly clear at this time that God is light, which is the one thing that is absolutely everything. Now, switching back to the scientific point of view, it should be much easier to understand why four seemingly different academic disciplines obey the same mathematical property of the inverse square law. The basic laws of geometry obey the inverse square law. The laws of gravity obey the inverse square law. The laws of electricity obey the inverse square law. Hello, Q. And the laws of radiation obey the inverse square law. The point being that even though the symbology and naming conventions are slightly different, the mathematical principle is the same because math is the fundamental language that is telling you that these seemingly incommensurable things are in fact the very same thing. So, from a scientific point of view and as an exercise in thought, if I could get all the scientists over the course of the last few hundred years into one room, I am certain that they would quickly figure out that they are discovering the very same thing which is only separated by the individual's point of view from that culture and time and chosen measure or observation. Where Isaac Newton would quickly realize that gravity is the diffuse steady state of magnetism, and this is why it obeys the inverse square law of universal gravitation. And Charles Calhoun would realize that his measure of standard unit of electric charge, now called Columns Law, or Columns inverse square law is analogous with Newton's inverse square law because Columns measure is nothing more than gravity in a coherent arrangement of electromagnetic charge. Or William Herschel, who would see that his dis discovery of radiation is a measure of both heat and exposure from electromagnetism. Or Sir George Airy, Astronomer Royale, should absolutely be vindicated in that the luminiferous ether is absolutely correct and in modern vernacular simply disguised as the field or even more recently as quantum foam. Or that Einstein's zero point uh, energy is nothing more than a scientifically sanitized version of the ether. Or perhaps Dr. Haramain and all other modern physicists would realize that this solution simultaneously solves both the grand unified theory and the theory of everything. In other words, the light bulb would come on and they would all realize that everything is light. So, switching to the religious point of view. If I could do the same thing and get all the spiritual leaders of the world's religions into one room, the conclusion would quickly become obvious. 
where the ancient Indian rishis would say, I recognize that as Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. And the Zoroastrians would say, that is our triad of Mithra, Ahura Mazda, and Anahita. And the Egyptians would surely recognize Ra, Set, and Thoth. And the Jewish religion, uh, you can see among the many trinities, that of Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. And the Christians would surely recognize the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just as the Norsemen would recognize theirs, Thor, Odin, and Loki. Now someone may be thinking, wait a minute, the Jews don't have a trinity. To which my answer is that, of course they do. You just have to know what you're looking at. In fact, they have lots of trinities. Here's just one. In the third month, it came to pass on the third day that Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, right in Exodus 19.1. Or how about Shabbat 88 Alpha, which says, Blessed be the merciful one who gave a threefold Torah to a threefold people through a thirdborn on a third day in the third month. It could be no more clear than that. In other words, the light bulb would come on and they would surely come to the conclusion that we are light. Okay, switching back to the scientific point of view. So this slide has some solutions, recommendations, and or implications for the scientific community. The first recommendation is to re-identify both the fundamental forces and further forces as electromagnetism and standardize its varying orders of magnitude. This logically leads to the second recommended task, which would be to begin to work on unifying all mathematics under the theory of everything. And a good place to start would be at the inverse square law. Also towards this endeavor, I have solved the Ryman hypothesis, which is the second on the list of millennial problems. I've solved it for the world in order to give humanity a huge leap in understanding fractal hypercubinal mathematics. That is to say, understanding the fifth dimensional state of consciousness from the mathematical point of view. All this leads to the implication that the scientific community must accept that we live in a fractal reality. The discovery of the quantum world already proves this underpinning to your reality. And the further implication is that academia must accept that light is superconsciousness itself. Finally, a recommendation is to change and merge the standard annotations of both particle physics and quantum physics. Although, I respectfully request that academia keep the standard notation for light. Hello, Q. Now, switching back to the religious point of view. So this slide has some solutions, recommendations, and or implications for the spiritual community. The first and second implication is for all religions to accept the immutable truth that God is light, which is the creator without form, and that all religions contain a physical personification of God and or gods, which is the creator in forms. It must also be accepted that the creator, which is light, is limitless and ever-expanding. The purpose of light is growth, just as the purpose of life is growth. These are two sides of the same coin, or rather, two points of view of the same God. One would also have to accept that all heavens and all hells are very real, and there is no limit to the Creator. Simply look through your telescopes at the heavens. One has to also accept that reincarnation is very real. And one must accept that reality is quite literally a standing wave of dream, which the ancients knew as Maya or dream time and many other names. In other words, you live inside a waking dream that you know is a reality. In an interesting cross comparison, it is like Einstein's theory of relativity, which postulates that the observer inside of the frame of reference has no way of telling if he is moving or not. But an outside observer can clearly distinguish the former's movement. In other words, from a philosophical point of view, a fish does not know he is in water until he is pulled out of the water and can observe the water from another point of view. Well, the same principle applies to the reality of man, and the only way out of the water for humanity is through the inner vision of your very own mind. Furthermore, one must accept that karma which is simply stated as the intent of your actions, has very real consequences both in this life and future lives. And is it of 
utmost importance that you accept the absolute fact that nobody can save you but yourself. The name of the game is the process of ascension and it requires you to think yourself out of hell and to use your mind to balance your heart. No one can do this for you but you. Finally, you must learn to accept each other. Look beyond the color of your skin and the various cultural influences and focus on the content of your character. Know that you are the many effulgences of Vishnu. You should know that the Creator loves diversity and that variety truly is the spice of life. Ladies and gentlemen, my website is celestialvision.info and on it you will find everything that I have discussed with you today to include the scientific solution to the Ryman hypothesis, which is the holy grail of pure mathematics, and the spiritual solution to opening your heart, which is the actual holy grail. And with that, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Please feel free to contact me at Aquarius at CelestialVision.info and feel free to leave any questions or comments down below. And please remember that sometimes it simply takes a Carl to show brilliant men what they are missing and that what eludes them is ironically right in front of their eyes.